Thanks all for coming. Um, I got a chance to introduce myself to um, many of you yesterday um, during my, my session um, where I was talking about kind of some of the work that we did in the UK government when I was there and that now involved with, um, with public digital um, of helping form very multidisciplinary teams um, both in government and in the private sector um, but to you know, make use of this what I was calling the agile dividend of all the sort of ability that we've, we've developed to, to build and deploy um, technology um, in order to then start thinking about how do we bring more people into those conversations, how do we work with, with more disciplines to have more impact. Um, so I'm not going to recap too much of that. If you missed that, I'm sure it will be on the, the YouTube channel soon. Um, but Viraj, I wondered if you could sort of share a bit more about, about eGov and about digits. And yeah. No. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so uh, first, first of all, uh, our name sounds like we are part of government. We are not part of a government. We are a, we are a uh, philanthropic mission. Uh, we are like a startup which is trying to see how the transformative power of technology can be used to make our lives easier. You know, uh, when we live in cities, when we apply for health services. I don't know how many of you have got a COVID vaccination certificate. A lot of you, okay. So, so that was the technology we built. It's called uh, Divoc, uh, and uh, and the whole idea is to see uh, and it, to see how, in especially in, in capacity constrained environments uh, like India, uh, Africa, uh, some some parts of Asia, how technology can leapfrog the development journeys of societies. So, I think. Uh, we all know the story of Aadhaar, UPI in India, how they have completely changed the, uh, changed the kind of uh, the landscape of, 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 uh, of how financial inclusion happens, how uh, you know, people get benefits and all those kind of things. So, so Eager Foundation was formed, uh, kind of founded in 2003 actually by Nanda Nilekani and Anshika Nadamuni to really see uh, how the cities can work better. Uh, by, by use of technology and uh, you know we've had our journey over the last 20 years and for the last six years uh, uh, since Nandan came back from his Aadhaar stint in, in the government, the, the focus has been how do you create what we call public digital infrastructure which is essentially a set of specs, protocols and software on which multiple solutions can be built to help societal problems from, you know, issuing vaccine certificates which are non-reputable to, you know, paying your uh, municipal taxes to, uh, you know, keeping your cities clean uh, to getting your licenses, licenses to do uh, various pieces of work. So idea is that you build, so there are three parts, obviously you need to build some kind of a foundational infrastructure. So you look at Aadhaar, UPI, they are not solutions, they are infra on which multiple solutions can be built. So, so by, uh, by kind of extension, they're mostly open source uh, and, and we are a non-profit, so we don't work for profit because it's very important to create trust in the system. So one, one part of it is building what we call population scale infra, uh, digital infra. Second part is what uh, James was referring to, having a multidisciplinary approach, just building software or code or specs is not enough. You got to create uh, conditions uh, from a policy point of view, work with governments to see how this can be adopted to, you know, uh, create uh, services, solutions for the citizens. So we do a lot of policy and advocacy work with the governments, uh, both in India and overseas. And the third part is how do you get markets and the ecosystem to come and use this infra to build solutions and platforms that they can use and they can monetize. So again, uh, we kind of work closely with. Uh, people like Big Four to, you know, uh, small software companies to see how they can use Digit. Our platform is called Digit, which stands for a Digital Infra for Governance and Inclusive Transformation. For them to use that and work with governments to deliver programs. So, for example, if, uh, you know, a government in, in Karnataka decides to do uh, a reform of how you pay your house taxes or how you raise grievances or how you apply for a water connection, one option is every city builds their own system and every department builds their own system. That's how governments typically work. I'm sure some of you have gone to the websites 
you'll have that experience that you will log into one web one website say you submit the form here go to another website and you know so how do you get a what we call a whole of government experience so idea is that you kind of work with what we call samaj sarkar bazaar the markets the government and the community actors to use this infra to create uh, impact at scale and speed so today you know uh, you've heard the covid story uh, and that was done in five, five other countries in india more than 26 crore 260 million citizens use our services uh, we are uh, about 2500 cities and towns in india from small town like mandya to you know chennai use our platform and uh, now we are looking to you know work in africa and and some of the other countries to see how we can take the same thing outside outside india so that's a short brief on on eager foundation right and i think there's there's been a lot of conversation at this conference over the last um few days about many of the challenges of of any kind of transformation um and and certainly my experience was that once we started talking about both bringing a, a kind of almost a kind of consumer product mindset to think about how we how we provide government services so starting with starting with needs and then deploying the best kind of skills and technology and design that we could to do that people kind of bought that to start with but when you started saying in order to do that we have to work quite differently we have to um think about the services that we buy in a different way we have to think about the skills that we get in a different way you started to run into lots of obstacles um and uh, open source is one that particularly sticks for me um governments are used to buying things um not to we were talking earlier about that the, there are these funny hurdles to taking something for free um and uh, more than that if they are getting something new it's kind of it needs to fit in an existing box but once we start talking about this kind of infrastructure you're breaking the boxes you're yes. talking very differently how has that sort of engagement happened for you with um with governments with a lot of difficulty yeah i think it's, it's not easy it's a, it's a it's a classic wicked problem as, as they call in the you know systems thinking that is a problem which is dynamic it keeps changing uh it's a problem which has high complexity it has multiple stakeholders and it has got a uh, you know temporal you know uh, kind of quality about it so so i i think there are two or three things one is you need to work with government especially uh, government is not a one composite there are governments in india there's a government at the in new delhi there's government every state has and the government every city has so so i think you need to find champions like anywhere else people who actually believe in that story and people who believe this and able to take risks i think that's the first thing we always look for is there a champion who can actually give it a 3 year shot and say ah yeah i am willing to take this risk yeah you know you can buy sap you can buy other erps and it might still fail but that won't be a risky decision because that's a common practice yeah. right so so i think one is finding those initial champions we call, we call them exemplars and i think once you find a champion it's important that you don't leave them an open source as a challenge it's mm -hmm. difficult to find you know resources it's difficult to find people who understand it so our approach is the first few champions we find in a new new area like punjab was our champion there was a amazing officer there who said yeah you know i'm i've gone to it delhi i understand what you guys are doing i'm willing to take the risk i remember sitting in a meeting with the minister him and the minister is asking him are you sure this is a risk you're worth taking and he said yeah i think i'll i'll make it happen but once he kind of kind of what into it we supported him to the hilt in terms of we had even program teams on ground we helped them deploy it we helped them you know uh, do the because we use the uh, kind of modern devops uh, architecture it's very difficult to find those skill sets so for a couple of years we ran the devops for them mm -hmm. so you need to actually be invested in their success if you find those champions and the third thing is you have to look at the human side of it you know i think sitting in bangalore it's very easy to imagine that you can design an app it will work in longer wall which is 20000 people but you got to have that humility to meet people where they are and actually change things you know because we realized for example we said you need to lodge a complaint uh, please take a photo you know so in in bangalore everybody understand you have to take the photo of the garbage heap the first thousand complaints we got there were photos of the people 
because when you're dealing with the government, government asks for your photos, you know. So I think that's, those are kind of things you realize when you, when you start working on, on the field. So, and the third thing is, once you have a champion, and once you have an exemplar which is successful, then it's easy because a lot of the bureaucrats know each other, it's a, it's a, it's a small community. Then you say, hey, Punjab has done this, can you do it in, in Odisha, can you do it in Uttarakhand, or can you do it nationally? And that's exactly what happened. So you need to now take those champions and let them advocate for you. So, so that's been our journey uh, in, in kind of trying to, uh, but it's, it's hard. I think self, getting, giving something free is very hard, getting engagement is very hard. And that's why you need a champion who's really invested in the success. Yeah, that definitely chimes with my experience. And I think it really fits with kind of some of the, the core starting points of, of, of Agile as well, of yeah. the kind of the getting to value fast. Of, um, I think large organizations of all kinds in every sector mostly think about the big win. They think about the, the thing, if we spend this much money over three years, five years, we'll achieve this, yeah. this large thing. And, and their, their IT approach will follow yeah. that. Um, and what we can do with the combination of sort of the practices we've developed and the sort of technology infrastructure that we've got is say, but how about a smaller but much, much faster awesome. win, um, which can build momentum and capital. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that, that, that human part's really interesting. It's a theme of conversations we've been having a lot and it connects with what I was talking about yesterday. Um, one of the things I find exciting is about if we get this kind of infrastructure right, we get the skills right, the ways that we can um, we can create new opportunities to experiment. Um, so yesterday in my, my session, I talked about the, the universal credit service in the yeah. UK, which is the way that people apply for mostly benefits if you're unemployed, but generally for low income um, households. And a big part of the purpose of that service is to help people back into work. And so there's a, there's a coaching element yeah. to it. And uh, there was an assumption that the, you want efficiency in that service. And, and so what you should do is every time somebody comes for a coaching session, you give them the next person who's available. Um, but that means they won't get the same person over time and they won't yeah. build a relationship. And there were other people who were saying, actually, you know, for this kind of personal development that this is part of, you want a personal relationship. And you ended up at a, a fairly classic kind of impasse of two opinions. <laughs> and, and normally, highest paid person would win yeah. <laughs> in that conversation. <laughs> But because that team had really invested in their agile practices, they knew how their infrastructure worked, and they knew how every part of the operation worked, they were able to reframe that as an experiment and say, well, let's actually run an A-B test. So some people will go into the queue, some people will get a dedicated support person, which might be less efficient, but will build the human relationship, and let's see which works. And, and over, I can't remember the period of time, a few months, the data was very clearly pointing to the human relationships win. Yep. Um, what I liked about that was, you know, partly, you know, people got jobs. <laughs> that yeah. was very good. Um, but it was as much a kind of validation of a lot of these practices that we've been working on. Um, and and the, that real focus on, okay, we, we can kind of get the technology, we can get the agile practices, we can get the service and system thinking in yeah. place. And then we can do, we, we can start thinking in this way. Yeah. You were talking about how I think you found that a lot of the time the real success comes from kind of the operators, the government yes. staff who are working. Yep. Um, I if you could sort of, no, it's, are, there, are there similar kind of it's a very good point you're making. In fact, I think we don't realize, we, we all think, uh, based on our few experiences we have with the government employees and government that they're all inefficient and, you know, they don't want to work hard. But like anywhere else, our experience has been 80% of them want to do an honest job and go home and you know, uh, sleep easy. Uh, so, so two things. One is, I remember speaking to this uh, revenue officer in one of the municipalities in, uh, it's called Zirakpur in, in Punjab, and I was just doing a research and just talking to him. And he said something very, very insightful. He's a, he's a postgraduate, you know, pretty smart guy. He's been working this job for seven, eight years. Uh, and typically they'll have a target of, you know, 100 crore of collections of property tax and everything in a, in a, in a particular particular uh, locality. And he's saying, look, come with me, look, I'll show you what I have to do. He said, if anybody comes on the counter and they want to see your, their last, last three years kind of receipts, he took me in the back office, there was this file like 12 feet high cabinet with ladder and everything. I have to go file by file, pull it out and show it to him. And he's saying, 
I think, and my cousin, who's like twelfth fail or you know didn't pass the you know high school, he drives a taxi and he has an app, right? So that's the so in a way the government is still in the nineteenth century way of working with files and everything, and the efficiency and dignity of work is just not there for a lot of people who work in the government and front lines. So so I think the point you're making about how to make their work easy. And one year later, I went to him and he said, oh, now I used to do two transactions a, uh, uh, an hour, right? now we do 15, right? So that's the, that's the level of difference. And the point you're making about, we forget a lot of people live in small towns in India, right? India has 4,800 uh, cities and towns. 50% of them are less than 30,000 people. So chances are a lot of people will know each other. So they, they respect in the community, you know? So, uh, you know, we, we, even today, 80% of transactions, although the platform is, you can do a WhatsApp chatbot, you have an app, you have a web, 80% of transactions still happen on counter. Because mm -hmm. that's how communities work, right? I don't know how many of you have old parents, but they'd love to go to the bank. You know, <laughs> they'll say, Are, kya karna hai? I'll just go and meet them and, and chat to them and come back. That's how communities work. And we should never forget, you know, technology is about humans. They should make them more dignified and strengthen the communities. So he said to me, you know, now people really say, oh, now you can come back home and also do you. My kids are saying I can come back home and do my work on my mobile phone. So that's the kind of things we miss sometimes when you look at as technology as just a commodity, which is just about efficiency, right? I think there's a very strong human element to that we should just keep looking at. And the point you made about value is really important actually, because typically, especially in government, the technology programs just take way too long. You know, just the cabinet is full of failures. But in part, this particular thing is in 90 days, we'll have 100 towns and cities live. And that happened. And that was just a, you know, the kind of the main headline of the success that this person had. Yeah. 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 I think that requires, um, I mean, that, that, that's a great success, but sort of comes back as well to that kind of bold and risk taking yes, leadership. Absolutely. Um, we had an experience recently where we'd helped um, an organization run a small scale pilot uh, for their new service, which was absolutely the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a front page news story right. saying only 200 people were able to use this service. And that's the sort of story that a, any organization wants to avoid because it's cast as this is failure. Yes. Even though we knew, no, that's success. They, they tested it with 200 people months earlier than they normally would have been confident doing any kind of testing. And it worked really well for those people, mm. but they learned some lessons. Yeah. Uh, and most leaders are not incentivized to put themselves in that position, even if long term that's the way to get yeah. to success. Yeah. Uh, it really required kind of doubling down on supporting those, those bold leaders who were Absolutely. able to sort of let that wash over them or have a kind of, what do you expect us to launch this at scale without ever testing it <laughs> kind of response. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and yeah, I always see the same thing kind of every sector. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of risk aversion that, that comes out, but it's the bold leaders who break through. Absolutely, absolutely. And there, and that, I think the point you make about, you know, pilots and, because government is all about scale. They are very good at scaling. I mean, we don't understand scale. They just can do, if something, something works, they scale it very well. Mm -hmm. Whereas they find it difficult to innovate. So I think, when we talk to the governments, actually we don't use the word pilot at all. Because mm. pilots are used, and governments, cupboards are full of pilots, which they have done, and then they said, yeah, it's done now. Yeah. Yeah. Because the commitment is not high when you do pilots. So we always call them exemplars. And at least 50% of your state will use one service, and you know, you know, if, if not everything. Right. So that there's a commitment, and there's a file, and there's a, they are training people, they're showing the politicians it's happening. So it's very important to we actually stay away from doing pilots. Yeah. We call them exemplars and we call them scale and speed exemplars. So the, both the things are called out that we do it fast. That's our job. Yeah. Scale, that is your job. So I think that, that's, the, that's the important thing. Yeah, I think that, that language point is really important. We didn't actually call this thing a pilot, but I, I sort of slip into that language quite yeah. naturally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I talked yesterday about um, situations where we, we you know, you want to bring everything that this community knows is kind of agile values, practices, and principles, um, but that language doesn't necessarily resonate, so we tend to use language about test and learn more yeah. often or find other things, but I think one of the 
one really important skill for anybody who's trying to achieve transformation is, is to be able to very rapidly understand the kind of the corporate language of whatever organization you're, you're talking to and kind of connect your principles with it, whether it's adopting that language or kind of subtly yeah. shifting it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the exemplars is, is a good one. Yeah, no, I think yeah, pilots are just sub behind in the government's pilots are just used as, a, yeah, you'll do pilot, come and do it, then you'll go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then um, I think w another of the things. So, in our work in the UK, and um, then also our work in Canada um, and a number of other places, has you know been about building new skills and practices within governments, um, but also then changing the way they relate to suppliers. So, um, once you break away from the mentality that everything is a large-scale IT program. You can think very differently about the companies that you might bring in to support you. You want more skills internally, but you're not going to do everything in-house. Um, and, and that's been kind of enormously exciting in places. There are, there are companies trading on stock exchanges that are doing it because we created a, a procurement environment and a collaborative environment that let them work with governments in yep. a different way. Um, we're also seeing, again, the same sort of thing with some of our big private sector clients. We're like, we absolutely need to break away from our established supplier base. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that's also really interesting is you can kind of create new marketplaces um, of kind of once you've got that infrastructure in place, people can create new services for people in, in quite different ways. And you were talking yesterday about kind of how that's yeah. playing out with your yeah. platform. Yeah. No, I think that, that's the most... Uh, amazing thing over the last uh, six years or so, the possibilities, and that's the advantage of the infrastructure approach that, you know, when you create it, you might have some use cases in mind, because mm -hmm. you cannot create without use cases, right? But when the adoption happens and the network effects kick in, people find their own ways of using it. So when we built Digit, it was primarily for urban service delivery, you know, normal things that you use in a city. Uh, but now there are uh, partners, both in the commercial sector and in the, uh, in, in the NGO sector, like Piramal Foundation is using Digit for all the work they do on education and health in five states. So they're saying, why should we build everything ourselves? Our main work is on the ground, you know, trying to work with communities. They have more than 10,000 people working in these states. Why would we not leverage something that's already built it's open source, it's reusable, and uh, they'll go live with a, what, what is called a, India has four and a half, 45 million, uh, 4.5 million outstanding disputes cases, which could be easily resolved. They're all sitting, sitting in the courts. So they've built an e-justice uh, kind of a uh, solution on top of Digit, which will be going live in Chhattisgarh. So I think your point is valid. It's a, the ROI on, actually on, uh, digital public infra is the is a public part of it. Is like everybody can participate. Yeah. They don't need us in the room. They don't, they don't need to pay a license fee. There's no gatekeeping. Mm. It's on GitHub. There's a lot of documentation. Of course, if you need some help in design, you know, we, we help you with the design design part of it. Uh, so, and then the governments that, like Punjab government, after we kind of did the enablement, they had an internal team uh, which we kind of enabled. They have built three or four new solutions on top of it. And, uh, and the market players are just finding use cases uh, as they get more attuned to how this works. So today, if we, we did a rough uh, calculation, just the programmatic money that the government has committed, the NGOs are committed, and the markets are participating, it's almost $700 million of you know, uh, market which is riding on something. So which is really, you know, uh, as, they, as they say, it is not what happens in the platform, but what happens on the platform, mm. which is which is a value. So leverage is leverage is huge, and and that is really uh, two things. One is the way it is built, and 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 uh, two is the all the resources you provide, you know, around that. Not just the documentation and APIs and all those things, but also some of the design thinking, like you were saying, changing their mentality from saying you don't have to do everything in one go. You can run sprints. You can do versioning. It's easy to deploy things in a in this kind of a DevOps environment and all those things. So so it's a it's a constant thing. But I think we are finding, you know, if you 
get the right stakeholders and do enough design thinking impatiently rather than saying this is how you do it. Mm. So we do a three day immersive workshop on you know reimagination technology for governance and I think people some people move some people don't move most people move and start thinking in a, in a different way. Yeah, yeah I think that's it's enormously exciting that we've been there's been a sort of civic technology movement kind of globally for what, probably 20 years yeah. now um, but and, and, and that's been a mix of people doing uh, not-for-profits and, and kind of very open source work. And I'm going to wait a moment to see if that goes quiet. There we go. Just carry some, on. and some, some hope it's time, not, time to see yeah. your 10 minutes left. <laughs> hope it's not too distracting. Um, uh, and there have been a lot of kind of for-profit businesses, but most of them have really struggled because while it looks on the surface, very easy to provide a better user experience as part of government. The, the kind of plugging into kind of the data you need, the, the business processes that exist, the, the making sure that actually you're not making things worse for people by giving them a deceptively simple user experience that doesn't actually connect with getting yeah. the service delivery that they need behind it. It's really, high, it's really hard. And I think that we're at quite an exciting moment for people who want to innovate and see business opportunities in, in that space. That, some of that hard work is being done yeah. of, okay, well, it shouldn't be the case that the data's not in the right place, so let's actually invest in that because that, that kind of stimulates it. It means innovators can focus on the innovative things, yeah. not the hard work behind the scenes. Yeah, a lot of the complexity has been absorbed. And yeah. also I think now there is, there is a playing field where you can have, you have markets, government has, you know, if, you know, uh, today, Digi is a national platform for urban governance. So it's been adopted by the government. They have a five-year mission running on it called National Urban Digital Mission. So it creates for innovators both the space to create something and also to test it yeah. and, and market it. So I think it definitely helps innovator to, and they don't worry about how it's going to deploy it and you know all those kind of things. So I think definitely there's yeah. a there's, there's, yeah. there's a big thing. In the UK government, one of our design principles used to be uh, do the hard work to make things simple. Yes, which was very much about this. Um, but then one of the th things I think is really important is in any sort of platform development, um, it can be hard to, to get the right feedback loops, particularly in the early stages of it. Um, so so the, the more we can get people, um, hopefully including people in, in the sort of this room in this community, doing some of that work of trying to create new services on top, trying to partner with governments to do things, the better we can establish that feedback loop and test. No, absolutely. I think, I, I, I think this is one of the kind of concerns we have, there are not enough people challenging, you know, we're saying we got to open APIs and, you know, all, all those funky stuff. But I think uh, if more people use it, then there's a community which can actually challenge that, have you thought of this? Have you thought of this? For example, I was talking about some of the tech decisions we made in 2017, now we're really rethinking. Mm -hmm. You know, they were made for India. For example, we have Kafka, you know, as, as, a, as a tool. But if you go to, yes, yeah, for 1 million people, you need that kind of yeah. scale. But if you go to a country which has 20 million people and you know, 2,000 transactions a month, why do you need to have such a heavy, heavy yeah. infra, right? So, so definitely, I'll you know uh, invite you all to look at the code, look at the uh, look at the website, look at the GitHub site, and uh, yeah, if you're interested in volunteering, give, give us a call. We're always looking for volunteers. It's a we're trying to solve very, very complex and huge problems. So more the merrier in, in that in that sense. Great. I'm wondering if anybody's got any questions for us. <laughs> Excellent conversation. Thank you so much for that. Can you hear me? Barely. Uh, is it better now? Much better. All right. Uh, thanks, Viraj. You actually opened up a big door for uh, innovators and vendors to I use the infrastructure uh, to help the public and public services. Uh, as you were pointing out, a few of the things that you realize that government officials work effectively and they are doing their best of efforts. And you also mentioned about how the technology will be helpful to uh, get together and have the communities work closely 
are there any other insights like this which you encountered or you saw and that were like all moments for you because in urban cities we don't realize all of these we take the technology for granted and we think that we don't work with humans we work with technology and we we, we never visit the bank right for example you are, you are saying 80% of the transaction happen at the counter so are there something like these which are eye openers for us like some things which we take for granted but you you saw them differently no definitely the other thing is uh, when you look at uh, and that's what i'm saying most of you read the the four india story india's you know, different levels uh, i think uh, other thing that we realized was even basic things like access to services right we take access to services as a, as a given it might be hard uh, but if you need to raise your voice and say I want to complain about something or I need something for my community, you can do it. But there are marginalized communities which don't even have access to services, right? So one of the things they, and even if they have access, they don't want to raise their voice because they don't want to be seen, okay? So I think that's where working with intermediaries is very important in a country like India because everybody, even on the digital part of it, they're, they're, they're in the margins of society, they want to be invisible in some way. So sometimes they're invisible, sometimes they want to be invisible, right? So working with, you know, local social workers, you know, uh, for example, in Andhra Pradesh, which is one of our, you know, been with us for seven years, we have a big program, they've got 70,000 what they call ward volunteers. They go door to door. If I'm an old uh, woman in a, in a slum, I need my pension to be processed. They go door to door with, you know, laptops and everything and actually deliver services there and there. So I think the access is a very important thing that we don't realize sitting here, you know, and the, and the choice that everybody should have. We will never think of an assisted service as a choice sitting here, but assisted service is a very big, uh, and you need to enable that on the same platform. So that's the, that's the kind of, from WhatsApp chatbot to assisted service, that's the kind of, you know, width of channels you need to make available to people. Yeah, thank you so much. Another one uh, connected to that is, like you mentioned about creating this infrastructure as a backbone for vendors and uh, innovators to use. But how do we support, because you, you're saying they will use it for free, but then how do you monetize and at least to maintain the infrastructure? Because you're supporting the public yeah. and government, but this infrastructure question, needs... How do we support ourselves? Uh, how, does, does, how does this infrastructure itself uh, should support. I mean, how do you monetize or how do you support this infrastructure? Yeah. So Not as say, a, yeah, please so right go ahead. now for the first kind of, uh, we are supported purely by philanthropy right now. So we have uh, Gates Foundation, Nandan Lilikani, Omidya Network and Tata Trust. And the idea was that you cannot be a creator of a public good because there, there's a element of holding trust as a so that everybody can work with you. So I think we're looking at a couple of models going forward uh, on, from a, because we provide a lot of services to both innovators and governments around the platform, not the tech part of it. The tech will keep running as a foundation because it's important to keep it open source and non-commercial and, and it's an MIT license. So if you're an innovator, you build something, you can choose whether you contribute back or not. But some of the services we provide, we are thinking of whether we should start a for-profit organization which can actually uh, you know, get not profit, but actually get some revenues which can be plowed back into the into the foundation. But still, it's it's not a question we've answered. We we're still thinking about it. All right, thank you. If I build on both of those. Um, so a couple of years ago, Amidia Network, who are one of the funders you just mentioned, um, commissioned us to do some sort of work on um, opportunity, but also work to be done on on open source in governments and. Um, we were responding in that piece of work partly to a sense that just because we've got something that's open source, you can take it, you can put it in place, and, and that's great. It just works, and there's no more work to do, and it's, it, it's continually free. Yeah. And we're laying out that there's a number of elements of capacity building that are needed there um, about changes in your, your vendor environment, changes in how you think about owning and operating software, um, whether you have a vendor do it for you or whether you do it yourself, because open source lets us change and respond much more quickly, we actually want to harness that, and we have to, because otherwise we're opening ourselves up to yeah. all sorts of risk. Um, so, I mean, if, uh, 
hopefully that's an interesting report for people. It's on the public digital website. Um, but yeah, it's a really important topic as, um, and that we make sure we keep bringing that to the fore because people get very excited about kind of open source digital public goods. They are a fantastic addition to what people can use, but they're not investment free. Yeah. Um, but I was also thinking about, um, so saying about kind of the, the communities and the, the people you work with in those, those communities. We do some work in, in Madagascar um, where you know, the, I'll get the statistics wrong if I use them, but um, more than half of the population, as I remember it, don't have regular access to electricity, wow. let alone kind of mobile, mobile devices. Um, so most of the services they receive are through centers in their, in their community, in their town or village. Um, and so when we've been talking there about of introducing a more digital approach, partly that's about ways of working within the kind of central government, but then it's about how do we, how do we design things so that the first value that's seen is equipping those local yep. centers to provide better, more joined up services to people, but ideally designed in a way so that if they hit a point as this country's sort of been hitting over the last few years of sudden massive growth of, of access to those things, they're positioned to adapt really yep. quickly. Um, but we even see the same sort of things going on in, in our work in the UK and the US and in the private sector where like last year I worked with a, a large clothing retailer um, and they were looking at their planning processes for the stock that they produced. And they sort of think about how, how do we keep up with all the Chinese marketplaces that produce lots of stuff on demand. And there's a realization that actually that's not their differentiator. Yep. Like actually the slightly slower but more deliberate design-led approach to things is, is important for them. But they'd really missed how do we support the people who do that design and planning within our business to operate more efficiently, to get things out a bit more quickly. And so the best thing that their technology department could do was to go and partner with those people yeah. and say, yeah, there's lots we could do about the consumer experience. There's lots we could do that's sort of on demand and, and so on. But actually, we're going to double down on supporting our staff who we trust to be great clothing designers. Yes. Um, so some of those sort of, you're not always thinking about the person at the yeah. end of the chain. You're sometimes thinking about the intermediaries kind of plays regardless of internet access, regardless of, of any of those dynamics. Hi, uh, I have two questions, I'll keep it short. Uh, number one being, uh, given we know how India's government uh, services have been majorly paper-based over so many years and so many years, and uh, even moving on to, though we want to move into a you know, digital space, what's been your uh, challenges and experience around, one on the digitization part, second is also about the standards, uh, be it uh, SOAP versus REST versus, you know, message queues versus something else. Uh, and in typically, because you don't want to be creating state by state different type of standards. And how is the, uh, this is more from the, from the angle around standards. How, what's been experience as well as challenges uh, faced between the governments? Because they might have a standard they don't want to change. That's one. Second question is around loss of jobs, which means primarily um, you're moving into a digital space where we always have been like, now I'm a revenue officer and I'm, I, my, I have a big office which has like seven people employed right now. All of my work is going to go digital. So what's been the resistance on that from that perspective in the people who are working on this with you or from yeah. the government side? Uh, those two questions is what I have. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe I'll answer the second one first. Uh, so I think uh, if you look at from a people who use the technology on the supply side in the governments, uh, I'll give you some numbers. In a, in a municipal environment, in a city environment, uh, for per 10,000 people in a city, India has uh, 2.3 or 2.4 employees, municipal employees. Uh, London has 16, mm -hmm. uh, New York has 12, Bangkok has 9. So we are, a lot of government departments are not hiring for a long time. So there's a huge understaffing. So it's not that people are sitting there and there's no work there. I think they have got too much work if you ask me. Okay. Second is we do a, uh, and I told you about the employee story. Other part of the story is we do a uh, independent survey by 60 decibels every year, 30 decibels every year, which talks to employees, citizens about what is a, the net promoter score of employees is about 82%. It's one of the highest in the world, they say. And that's because on an average, their self-reported number is the same 19 hours a week. So I guess I would say 
it, and when I joined this sector, I worked in private sector before that, before this for till 2016. I thought same that the employees will actually, people who are on the front line will have resistance. I think they welcome it because it's really takes a drudgery out of their work and gives them dignity to, to belong to the 21st century. The world has moved, right? When they're, when they're getting Amazon and all these things delivered on their, uh, why can't they have the same experience when somebody uh, put, puts a request for water connection? It should be like Swiggy. Your connection is in, it's assigned to Ramanatham, it is now going to be measured and that's what happens. And that's what happens with the, with the platform. So I think we've been very, very happy with that. The second part was uh, around, you know, how do you, uh, sorry, what was your second part of the question, sorry. Standard, yeah. So, so I think, yeah, so it's a, it's a, it's a, we have been pushing the central government to do standards and we've got few standards published. Uh, so the trick here is to realize that India is a federal state. You cannot have one standard. In fact, you can't even have a state level because local governance is, is a local subject, you know, art, art, Article 76. So you got to design the platform that you abstract saying, okay, we know everybody needs billing. You know, a bill is a bill is a bill, you know, whether you're doing it for your traffic violation or if your property tax. So abstraction has to be right, but you know every city calculates the property tax in a different way. Every city has a different workflow for fixing a sanitation problem. So those things are very, very flexible from a configuration perspective. But on the basic fundamental, what we call, what we call the shared services, the 27 of those, the specs and standards have, don't move that much. I mean, I've got some of the core team uh, people here, they can talk more about it. But they stay pretty, pretty stable. Uh, we, have, we have issued them as recommended specs, adoption of them as standards happens slowly in the government. So I think they've, they've adopted three of those for public grievances, for property tax and one more for trade license. Uh, but what we have seen is, uh, you typically have to do five to seven percent kind of uh, configuration for a for a local context. But you need to have that flexibility in, in, the, in the platform. You cannot dictate one standard from sitting from 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 Delhi or from the state capital. Mm. On the on the, um, the jobs part, it reminded me of one of the earliest services we worked on in the UK was the lasting power of attorney. So it's preparing for the eventuality that you can't manage your life anymore, that sort of dementia or other aging um, primarily. And um, that had been a massive pile of paper forms. Most people paid a lawyer to do it, which meant only people who could afford a lawyer did it. Um, and with, we have a very aging population, this was gonna become a problem. Um, we, we worked on a new online service for people to do that application, made it much simpler to fill in the forms. Um, and what we saw was that the, the staff, who, you still had to print out the form and sign it because there was a law that said that and it's taken several years to change that law. Yeah. Um, but we made it much easier to get to the point where you could just print the forms and sign them yeah. without the lawyer's help. Um, what had been happening previously was that some, somewhere over 25% of the forms when they arrived in the office were immediately sent back because of mistakes. And it was mistakes like you had to write your address five different times and if you'd written it slightly differently, that was a mistake. So you had all of these staff who were employed to take things out of envelopes, say, yep, standard mistake, put it back in an envelope, send it back again. Um, very, very rapidly that number went down as soon as the online service was up. And, and we, we got this message from the, um, the back office staff saying, we've got a problem dealing with the calls we're getting. When we go into our case management system, there's no way to record positive feedback. Yep. And so we had to help them add a button to say somebody's called up because they quite like the experience, um, which, was, which was great for, for their, their dignity, their job satisfaction, yeah. um, but also then meant that with an aging population that is going to need more help with this service, they were set up to scale to deal with that new demand. Um, like there were still going to be people who needed help, but you could focus on the actual help, not the, yeah. no, nope, you wrote your address wrong, sending it back Go to back. you. <laughs> Uh, Viraj, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So, uh, whenever uh, we discuss the inclusion uh, charters and when we talk about the corporate social responsibility initiatives that organizations can run, right, there's a lot of this uh, technology assisted uh, uh, solutions like um, people, the young uh, geeks, the technologists, all these 
uh, people bring forth ideas on uh, working in partnership to solve some kind of uh, assist providing assisted solutions, basically the low cost assisted solutions, mainly in the context of India, like uh, maybe the solutions that are already available may not be compatible. And all these ideas keeps coming up in our conversations. So um, one thing that I wanted to uh, ask you was about what kind of partnership opportunities probably can we run a group hackathon because hackathons are very effective in terms of at least building POCs, validations. So are these opportunities available? Something that we can co-create and then see how to position it because maybe the requirements from government, the pace at which we churn, maybe it will take time, but can we do something around this? Oh, absolutely. I think we'd love to do that. I think, please understand, we are a philanthropy, so we are very thin on resources. So we always say we are a scarce resource in the system, but what you're saying is music to my ear. Uh, Jojo Mehra, our chief product officer, is here. So I think if you want to talk to him and see, we can organize a hackathon, do something together. We have a list of problems you want to solve, you know, including how do you, uh, kind of, uh, in Africa, there are some countries where even, you know, literacy is an issue. Can you work with icons and stuff like that and speech? So we've got a bunch of problems and you can bring your own problems and see how we can jam together and, you know, use uh, the platform to solve some of those problems. But we'd love to do that. Yeah, I, I actually will bring volunteers also who would execute well, that. Yeah, yeah that will be awesome. Thank you. Hi, Viraj. Um, Hi. My question is, it's not a question. I just wanted you to share your uh, journey on the COVID-19 certificate, right? That was really amazing and fabulous. So I just wanted to, if you can g just give us a gist about it. Uh, how how was the journey like yeah. because it was a very short one and the the result was awesome so yeah. so i think and i, I think the uh, the theory of scarce resource is very important for organizations like ours because we can't be doing things that other people are doing so two things happened in covid uh, when the first lockdown happened that's our other story and there was a very harsh lockdown and people could not even go to the factories to produce food and everything so we got together with ministry of food uh, with Try, with PNG, uh, Unilever, and a bunch of volunteers. Within seven days, the first national COVID e pass was made for essential services. So factories could issue those passes themselves. And they were again a verified credentials and all those things. And the more than nine states use it. So that's an example of again how collaboration can happen on open platforms and you know those kind of things. The the the, the kind of uh, die walk or the COVID nineteen is a similar story. Uh, when we, we thought that the vaccination is coming up, of course, all the, all the countries were gearing up for the large-scale vaccination rollout. But we thought maybe everybody will not be able to have it because you need to give millions of vaccination in a day. It's not like a typical you know, uh, vaccination program. So we thought, can we build something which is open source, fast to deploy, and population scale for countries which don't have systems? So that was the thought process. And it was built in a modular way that they can take the orchestration bit. Uh, they can, a lot of them have very good inventory system, or they can just take the credentialing, which is the verified certificate that I have actually been uh, vaccinated and I can travel. So a lot of countries had adopted just the. So it took us three months to build it, uh, and another, and that's what happens when you have when you work as a mission. You know, we have, you know, and uh, and another, you know, 16 weeks to get into five countries. But it was all on a, on a, was kind of born on a hypothesis saying they, this will be the scarcity in the system, let's solve for it, rather than trying to solve for how to move oxygen tanks because a lot of people are working on that anyway. So it's a, it's, 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 it kind of works like that. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ankur and uh, the question I have is, uh, I, I'll quickly share my context where I'm coming from. So uh, for the last 12 years I've worked in consumer space and I've built products and a lot of them failed because, and one of the examples was I was building a uh, marketplace uh, at Grofers and I was building tools for sellers in India. And being an engineer, I always looked at Shopify and I thought it would be cool to just build something that sellers can just sign up and get their store live without any human intervention. Uh, my biggest learning there was we spent 18 engineers two, two months and nobody used it. We actually just got seven sellers on board and uh, and I learned that like I did not do user research, I did not really understood who our user was and they were really scared of tech actually, that's the pro problem, right? And we should have built tools for somebody else in the chain. Uh, and that led me to really 
see how it's very difficult to empathize with consumers in a diverse ecosystem as India, right? Uh, and and if you don't do that, it could lead to a lot of wastage. You build something and it is not really used. Uh, my my belief or my 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 current assumption is in government that doesn't uh, happen because government can enforce usage, right? That you if you have to sign up, if you have to like do anything, you have to have an Aadhaar. So however tedious process is, you just have to like go and do it. Uh, I want to like know from your experience that has it has there been a scenario where you built something uh, but it was not adopted on the ground as much as you imagined because uh, because of the lack of understanding or uh, of the user or the solution is not really good for them to be able to use it effectively yeah. has that been no, i think yeah and that has happened uh, plenty of times to us and uh, it's, it's a good point you made about government they have prisoners not consumers in that sense right so they've got hostages but what I think, uh, India is also a, so the initial part of our journey, we worked with some of the slightly more advanced states like Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. So some of our products were very, very complex, right? So I remember uh, we deployed uh, in Punjab the first version of a, a property tax system. And it just didn't, you know, it was a small pilot and it just, people were not able to use it. And I, we, we did the, then did a demo to the, the Kind of CEO of the of the uh, of the urban department, and he said, "I just want something simple. People should know how much they have to pay, and just pay. I don't want all this. Whether you need a mutation, whether your house, this thing. I don't even have the basic registry of how many households I have in in Punjab. So I think understanding where a particular state, where a particular uh, kind of system is, is very important. Uh, so I think we've had. Uh, I've got. I can." You give a lecture on that, one of the failures we've had. Even something like WhatsApp, we realize that unless it sounds very cool, right? But unless you make it really easy for them to adopt it, not from a citizen point of view, but you need to get somebody to do the, you know, WhatsApp service, the billing and all those things. The procurement of that was so tough for the governments, right? So it's not as simple as the SMS service, mm -hmm. right? Because you need to get another commercial entity. So thinking through some of those things also becomes becomes important, how will they, if you do something, how will they procure it, right? Mm -hmm. But we did a recently in Odisha, we did, uh, you know, 80% of India doesn't have uh, sewerage, the underground sewerage. It's basically, they have septic tanks and they need to be kind of emptied at a, at a better frequency. So we designed a uh, app saying, okay, somebody will raise a, you know, I need my septic tank cleaned, the truck will come, it'll kind of suck out and go out. We realized, 60% of places a truck can't go inside. They usually have these small scooters mm. on which they, <laughs> on which they, it was during COVID, so we couldn't do so many field trips also. So this keeps happening all the time. And I think you just, mm. every day you learn something. Yeah, I'm thinking of a, a couple of things. Um, one of, when people talk about digital public goods around the world, one of, one of the ones that they, they talk about a lot is a service we built called Notify. Yeah. Um, it's very, very simple. It just kind of orchestrates access to, to SMS, to email, to, and to print in some places. Um, but rather than each different government service having to go and set that up for themselves, it's a simple API you can plug into. I think about 17 different governments have picked that up and, and used it. Just because we didn't even set out to make it an open source product. We just put it on GitHub with an open license and yep. some people saw it and wanted to use it. Um, we never actually set out to make Notify. We started out thinking that what was needed was a status tracking service. So I've applied for my passport, I've applied for this yeah. license, where is it in, in, in the system? And I still think from a complete end user point of view, that would be a very attractive thing. But the, the user research we went out and did as we started to build prototypes of it, with people saying, yeah, I'm not sure if I'd use that or not. And we did, like there wasn't the confidence to kind of, well, let's build it and see, um, but more importantly, we realized most of the underlying government services just weren't ready to use it. Yeah. We couldn't get reliable data about enough services to be able to guarantee to people that what they were seeing there was right. So pulling back to notifications, again, that's a thing which most services can much more easily connect to. It delivers 50% you know, of the value because you at least know that you'll get a reliable text message saying your passport's got to the next stage of processing. Kind of did the job. Yeah. Um, 
So, and that was a that was a really important thing because it was it was partly it was working against the logic of the system, which says we're going to fund you to do the thing you said you were going to do. And we went but actually the thing we said we were going to do was the wrong thing to do yeah. right now, um, but we're going to keep the money and we're going to do something different with it. Um, the uh, the, the other thing, and I think that kind of ability to do research is, is so super important. Um, another of the services we worked on was a, a carer's allowance. So if in the UK you have a, a member of your household who needs 24-hour care, there's an extra benefit that you can get to, to help you to help them. And um, the, the easy bit of the work we did on that to talk about is we made it much easier to change the forms that you fill in and yeah. remove some unnecessary fields and so on. The really valuable breakthrough was when we realized that we finally put some analytics on the service. And we saw that the spikes in demand were at two or three o'clock in the morning. And so we went out and did some research with some of the users to say, why is this? I said, well, it's because I'm spending all of, my, all of the waking hours caring for my relative. This is the only point in the day where I can provide that support. support yeah. And what we were able to do was, was partly you know, about the online experience, but it was more change the opening hours of the support center on it. To yep. Say, we were providing nine till five telephone support for that service. That was useless, complete yeah. waste of government resources. Having a 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. service um, looked a bit more expensive because you have to pay people for working out of hours, um, but meant it was there when people needed it, and overall that reduced waste in the system because people could get through the service first time, they got the support they needed quickly, and so they didn't need to draw on all of the things that come with failure. Um, but you, you sort of mentioned doing the research. It's, I'm always fascinated by all the subtle things that you learn when doing research that go well beyond the kind of, does this user interface make sense to somebody, yeah. or even do they want this product, but what's going on? And the last talk kind of covered this. What, what are their life circumstances? How do we connect to their life circumstances? Okay, I had a question. So, um, I feel like in a country like India where we have so many challenges, so something which you have come up with or your uh, volunteers and all whatever you have come up with, so that's really helpful. So, my question is around the efficiency of the system which has been put in place, like with respect to vaccination and all, I completely understand it's helping everyone. But there are certain other things also which I am not sure how many what all apps you have but I feel there are many government apps which we have where we lodge the complaints or we ask for help so my question is around the efficiency of those systems whenever we are lodging a complaint and all so do we collect any data how many of them are getting resolved some question some KPIs around that how efficient it is and how much is it really helping the general public so that yeah. is my first question so after that I'll be asking second one yeah. so absolutely I think so I, I guess the biggest thing when you as a citizen interact with government is usually things go into black hole and you don't know what's happening what would you know status ranking for example right second thing is when it is resolved, nobody asks you, has it, let's say you, you complain about there's a garbage dump outside my house, it needs to be cleaned. So there are two or three things. One is the whole experience is tracked through a, uh, what I call a chain of custody, saying you've raised a complaint, it's, it's a irrepeatable data which goes into the, every event which happened on that complaint is captured and reported back to you. Second thing is, in terms of whoever touches that on the supply side to kind of create greater transparency and accountability, it's captured. So I can send you the links to some of the dashboards. You can actually see a complaint go through the various stages, say it went to Manjunath, he said he needs to go to sanitation, it goes to him. And after a certain time, it escalates. Uh, by the way, Bangalore doesn't use our system, so, so uh, but it goes, it escalates to the next level. Uh, so essentially, if you look at end-to-end -end measurement of it, only way you can measure it is the citizen satisfaction is, what is the SLA it's been done in? and what is the satisfaction of the citizen. So I'll give you an example from Punjab and Andhra Pradesh. In, in Andhra Pradesh, when we started in 2016, they used to get across the state 15,000 complaints. Okay. And uh, not, only 70% of them were resolved. Today they get more than 120,000 complaints a year. Okay. And 99%, 95% of them are solved in the SLA. They used to take 23 days on an average to resolve a complaint. Today it's four days. So, so systemically, it's not that there are more complaints, but because people have more trust in the system, right? See, people don't mind waiting for government services. 
you know, I think we all expect it will not be like Amazon or, you know, uh, Flipkart. But they want to know what is happening and who's accountable. Is something happening or not? A lot of times you just put something in and just, where is it? Right? Mm. So we've seen time and again on service delivery, and this is what you call a systemic impact. That people know because there is, there is, uh, every event is being captured, so they can be audited at, you know, uh, and when citizens see that something is happening, they engage more with, with the government. Okay, uh, so um, my second question is around like whatever you, you guys are doing, I think it's a great work for the country. I came to know about it today, to be very honest. <laughs> And why we are not doing some kind of branding and marketing around it so that more and more people who are willing to get engaged, they start getting engaged with it. I've got my marketing head. I just, we just had a marketing <laughs> head like two months ago. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think you're right. I think uh, Nandan who's on our boat says you guys, you guys are the best kept secret. So I think, and it's a, it's again a, how an organization evolves. We evolve from a, Organizers that work in the trenches and our culture is that you don't want to take a lot of credit, you know, it's basically government does the work, but your point is valid. It's a, it's an asset that the whole society should know about, right? It's, and it's not ours, it's, it's open source and, and people should be able to leverage it to solve problems in their own context. So I, I take your feedback, we're working on it, right? And this is a part of it that actually last year and a half I've started talking more, even I used to be just busy talk to that bureaucrat and somebody said, you, this is your main job, you know, you need to go and talk to people and get the story out so that people can engage us. But your point is valid. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Vrish. I'm here. Yeah. Question from myself. Uh, so while building these public digital infrastructure tools, who is your, whom, whom do you think as a customer? Is it the government officials who is going to use it or the public, because both have conf may have conflicting priorities, difference, different needs. So, whom do you have in your mind as a consumer or a majority who is going to use it? Uh, and I would like to know your thoughts on I, that. I think we are very clear. Consumer is, uh, you know, Ahmadi or the citizens of of, of of the country. How do they get easy to access, trans transparent services? wherever they are. I think that's the end point we want to go to. But to do that, you have multiple stakeholders that also need to align. You know, the point you were making earlier, right? If we don't have the right tools, I can create a lot of, in fact, a lot of the problems in civic tech have been that the demand has been created, mm -hmm. but the supply side is not really, uh, you know, if, if, if I create a beautiful complaints tool for everybody, but it doesn't link into the, like, like in Andhra Pradesh, actually, when you raise a complaint standing here and say it's a sanitation complaint, it maps your GIS and straight away routes it to the sanitation office, office for that ward, okay? But if you don't do the supply side and look at them and saying how are they going to use it, you'll not succeed in delivering it to the citizen. Third thing is the policy side, the people who run the cities, the city managers, if they don't have the data on their fingertips to see what's happening, where, how many black spots are there in the city, how will they allocate resources, right? So I think. That's the challenge of a product manager in a in, in, in this kind of you you do have a really a multi stakeholder or you're constantly trading off right but I, I feel this this narrative of a clash of interest I don't think it's, we have experienced it that much most people want to work efficiently solve problem right there are, there are champions who want to deliver good services and they get the system around it. But I think if you design it well and keep all the point of views across, it should be, yeah, sometimes it works. Most of the time it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah I think when we talk to organizations about transformation, we often talk about going through sort of four different phases of it. And the first one is a kind of finding your champions and getting yeah. enough people on the yeah. same page yeah. that you can do something yeah. and picking the thing where you're going to make the first impact. And almost always that first impact is somebody outside your organization, it's your customers, it's your citizens, it's, it's whoever. But in order to serve them, you have to work radically differently yes. from how you're used to. You then go into phases which are usually, okay, let's try and do that a few more times and see what lessons happen when we try and repeat it. And then you go into a phase which is saying, how do we make this sustainable yeah. and make the new way the easy way to get things done? Yeah. Um, and 
you, having kind of infrastructure, having platforms helps you move through those phases more quickly, but you still need to, you still need to go through them. And, and it's that getting to people outside of your organization, because every organization exists to some level to serve people outside of itself. None are entirely about themselves. Yeah. Um, th th that's the thing that tells you, are we on track? Are we, are we going in the right direction with this? And usually also builds the political capital internally. We've done something better for our customer. We've done something better yes. for our user that lets you get into that scaling, sustaining piece. Thanks, James. Uh, time for one last question. Okay. Uh, we are already into the lunch hour, so we'll wind up with this. Out of interest, I just want to know, is it somewhere connected to my GOV app? Because uh, I, being there as a change agent, I post, uh, we, we take part of quizzes and we create taglines for all the ministries' uh, uh, schemes. And we, we, we have a points, we have a dashboard that's been built. And I see that the public grievance portal for Ministry of uh, Consumer Affairs and all that will, was integrated, like you said, it was different earlier, where we go into the MyGOV website and then we would be able to take it. But I have seen that eGOV as part when you conduct hackathons and others where we co contribute as, con uh, as a pub public. So to answer her question, we have MyGOV as a uh, mobile app. Which yeah. integrates with all your work where we can be contributors for uh, from India. Yeah. And, 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 and my gov, uh, Abhishek Singh, who's the yeah. head of METI, we've been working with him to see. We're working on something called a unified service interface, actually creating standards uh, and specs for a. I mean, government delivers more than 650 services, right? How do you create a, you know, standard and a spec that everybody can use when they're building that service? Uh, so, so I think uh, we could work very closely with uh, Abhishek Singh and my gov team. Sure. Thank you, James. Thank you, Varesh, uh, for an insightful discussion. And uh, because most of us have been like users of the system. So thank you so much for this. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, you, team. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>